I'm Tim Oberweger. I'm virtually in front of the law school with uh, Dean Michael Cahill. And for those of you that are joining us and see an amazing plethora of incredible real estate practitioners, just know that this is a really amazing opportunity for you to hear from them about how they are navigating and reinvigorating a real estate legal career here in 2020 during a pandemic and the crisis of a lifetime and how we're going to move forward from there. So, um, again, I'm Tim Overweger and I'm with Stuart Title. So I work with real estate professionals, big and small, all over the country, but I really get great joy when I get to work with a group like we assembled today of real estate professionals who are Brooklyn Law School at their core. And that's where we are today uh, to talk to you about the legal career in real estate and how to navigate it at this time. So without further ado, I want to welcome Michael Cahill, who's going to welcome us. So I'll turn it over to Michael. That's exactly right. I am here to welcome you all. Um, Joining Tim in the Brooklyn Law School courtyard uh, on this warm day, uh, here to welcome you all uh, to our first virtual real estate roundtable. I'm sure there will be many more to follow, Uh, hopefully only some virtual and some in person, but uh, however we can get you here, we're delighted to have you here. Uh, This is really uh, among the best kind of events that we had, in my opinion, because it's partly an opportunity for you to reconnect with your law school, but it's really primarily an opportunity for you to connect with each other uh, and do something that is professionally useful for you within your own practice area. Um, So we really like being able to have events that are useful for people within uh, certain fields of law, uh, and no better field than real estate where we really have, uh, as Tim said, a plethora Uh, of people practicing all over uh, real estate and uh, really um, it is a a great um, uh, part of our alumni network of which we are particularly proud Uh, and we're really delighted to have so many people from so many different settings uh, here to talk to you um, so that our strength in real estate and the strength of our real estate alumni network can be passed on to the next generation. It's great to have so many people here from the classes of uh, 2016 to 2020, as well as some current students. So this is a great professional opportunity for you, and we're really happy that this will be a chance for us to maintain what is an area of strength for us. And we have a great panel of people here um, to do that. So, of course, you've already met Tim, uh, who is at Stewart Title Company, but as importantly for tonight's purposes, is a member of the Professional Development Committee of our uh, Alumni Association, uh, who in that capacity organizes events just like this one, uh, and we're very pleased that he does so. Uh, we're also joined by Bob Alleman, a shareholder at Greenberg Traurig, uh, Lisa Bova Hyatt, an Executive Vice President for Legal Affairs and the General Counsel at the New York City Housing Authority. Uh, Carl Dowden, uh, at, uh, a solo practitioner at his own law firm. Uh, I believe Craig Price will be joining us uh, if we can surmount certain technical difficulties. He's a partner at Belkin, Burden, and Goldman. We have Richard Sobelson, who's not only an alum, but a long-serving member of our adjunct faculty, who is uh, vice president at Cohen Brothers Realty Corporation. Uh, and we have Nikki Sismanakis, a partner at Goldstein Hall. So a number of people practicing in different firms, large and small, uh, some uh, in-house, people who can really uh, describe real estate practice from a variety of different angles. So it's really great to have uh, all of them here. Uh, We're also joined by uh, Molly Drescher, one of the co-presidents of our uh, Real Estate Society, uh, along with Daniel Landau. So uh, Molly will also be uh, moderating the Q&A later. Um, So great to have the next generation of great Brooklyn lawyer uh, here on the panel with us. Uh, And uh, I hope I can, uh, well, I can certainly welcome, but I hope I can turn it over to uh, Debbie Bechtel, uh, who was um, uh, not personally but electronically mute uh, for a little while. Uh, Debbie, of course, uh, most of you already know, not only as 
um, the creator of our corporate and real estate clinic, uh, but really as um, the glue that holds together our uh, real estate alumni community. Um, we're really happy that over the last decade or more, we've built up a real estate curriculum that is equal to uh, the capacity of our alumni base so that we can train real estate lawyers in a very sophisticated way. And uh, Debbie has been integral to that effort and has really uh, expanded our real estate curriculum in a very thoughtful way so that we're covering all the bases. Um, so uh, we as a school really owe her a debt um, and uh, our current students are benefiting from uh, her efforts to uh, really improve what we're doing in the area of real estate. Um, uh, Debbie's going, I hope, going to introduce our program. Um, uh, I will I will apologize for Debbie based on her technical uh, difficulties, Team Cahill. All right. Well, Tim, uh, we're going to let you take it away then. I'm going to do the best I can, and I will tell you that, Team Cahill, we are so thankful for you joining us today and for your support for not only this program but for prior real estate uh, practice area programs, and we will be asking you to attend many more uh, in the well, future. I'll be here. So, so we appreciate you, and and thank you for not only being a great leader but also a great supporter of the real estate practitioners Thanks. group. Thanks very much. Now I'm going to fade away into the audience, and uh, now I just get to watch and learn uh, rather than being part of the panel. So thanks very much, Tim. Take it away. Thank you very much again, Dean Cahill. Uh, I'm going to speak on behalf of, of Debbie Bechtel. First of all, uh, Debbie is not only so thankful that all of these great alums have decided to join us as panelists, but also I'm sure she is gushing that we have 57 people on this call, which just shows the amount of work that Debbie put in because this was her brainchild and she's very modest. So I will toot her horn. This was all about trying to help people at a time when there is a lot of uh, concern about practicing in any area, but specifically in real estate where there has been a tremendous downturn in transactions uh, leading to my availability on many a Zoom call. Uh, but I do think that this is a great opportunity for all of our panelists, as well as all of our uh, audience members, to really get a feel of what it's like to practice at all different areas in the real estate area. And I know Debbie was very specific about how to curate the right group of panelists and she achieved great success. So I'm going to give her a round of applause for putting this together. So thank you, Debbie. Um, all right. So here we are. Uh, we have entered a new uh, area of what I like to call a new paradigm of COVID-19 reality and real estate as the backbone of many a business uh, from hospitality all the way down to, you know, any other brick and mortar location has really borne the brunt of a lot of the hurt that is happening. Uh, that being said, uh, today's news from Facebook and from uh, Apple and from others at the closing bell of the stock exchange is quite robust. Sales are up for virtual uh, businesses. So there is some real pivoting happening in the world of real estate. Um, the, the real opportunity is for you as our audience members to find out what the next course is use that Brooklyn Law School school training and the acumen that all of you have and find a way to not only reinvent yourself, but maybe create a new opportunity that you never thought existed. And we are here as your panel to help guide you through how we got to where we are. And I will do a hopefully uh, somewhat passable job of moderating and keeping all of these great professionals moving forward, as I know they have a lot to share. So without further ado, I'm going to move to the introductions of the panelists. Uh, Dean Cahill did do a great job of doing so, uh, but I will turn it over in alphabetical order uh, to first Robert Alleman of Greenberg Charig. He's a shareholder there and very proud of his uh, 
uh, recent uh, level of, of, of reaching that shareholder uh, status. So congratulations again, Robert. Um, and we're just going to talk about your uh, starting path. And, um, and before we do that, I've been reminded by uh, the dutiful and also amazing uh, student, rising 2L, who worked with both Bob and myself, Molly Drescher, uh, to ask all of you who are watching at home or at work to ask questions that she will curate and present at the end of our program. So anyone who has a question throughout, please use the chat function on Zoom to ask your question. All right, Bob, back to you. Why don't we talk about uh, your trajectory? Tell us about graduating Brooklyn Law School. Tell us a little bit about yourself and how you ended up where you are at the uh esteemed firm of Greenberg Trout. Thanks, Tim. And thank you also to Debbie and to Dean Cahill for having me here and for organizing this panel. And thank you to everyone who's joining um, and listening and in. If you're here, you're probably already doing the right thing um, because having been in Brooklyn Law School starting my second year when the financial crisis of 2008 um, changed everyone's world and turned the real estate world upside down. Um, One of the ways that I personally feel I survived wasn't just by continuing to work hard, no matter how weird the world got around me and all of us was, um, was by listening to advice from people, especially uh, people at Brooklyn Law School, because I find that the professors and the deans and the, the people that you, you're associating with that brought you here are people who can give you good advice and help steer you um, in the right direction on those days when you're unsure and even when those big decisions of, of, of what you need to do next come along. I certainly wouldn't have been here if I hadn't sat down with Dean Wexler at the time and, and when I had job opportunities in front of, in front of me and asked her what she thought I should do. Um, and I think if you're here, you're, you're open to that. And that's a very, very good thing. I was um, also, you may also be surprised that when I got out of law school and started my, my first job, in securities at Deckert, I was a CMBS attorney and CMBS had evidently just completely collapsed the economy, um, you know, only about two and a half years earlier. So I definitely think that while things never go back to the way they were ever, um, no matter how bad a recession and as we're learning, um, you know, recessions can come with pandemics, no matter how bad things get, um, you know, the way forward that I felt um, for me um, was always to keep focused on what I was doing and keeping, you know, keeping open to good advice about what to do next. So, Bob, in terms of the trajectory ending up at uh, Greenberg Trial, was that something you had aspired to uh, when you went to Deckard to practice in real estate? Or tell us about that evolution of how you ended up at, at Greenberg Charm, just quickly. I came from a real estate background. I came from actually an investment background. I worked at a family office for three years. And I did want to be in dirt real estate. Uh, I did not get my wish out of coming out of law school because of the way, look, I mean, when I was walking out of, on-campus interviews in in the summer and fall of 2008, um, right after Lehman collapsed, um, law firms would actually disintegrate as I walked out the door. Um, I I guess you're the poster child for saying, you know, it's been bad before, yeah. and now you're doing fine. You got a nice, beautiful... uh, uh, location where you're working, you, you, you have a beautiful new baby and, uh, not new baby, but you're, you're a partner at a very large law firm and you're practicing in the dirt real estate area, which is what you wanted. So congrats That's to you. We'll get, yeah. to, we'll get to go a little bit further in depth about getting that transition, uh, 
when we go around the room a little bit more. But I want to keep introducing. Let's move on to Lisa uh, Bova Hyatt. Can you, Lisa, just tell us a little bit about how you have uh, navigated your career into the real estate world now with the New York City Housing Authority? Absolutely. Um, thank you all so much for being here. Um, as Rob said, uh, the fact that you're here is sort of half the battle. Um, I will tell you that I've spent the last 26 years um, in real estate, and every job from my first uh, career or my first uh, job that I received um, when Professor Crea, who is sort of an iconic Brooklyn Law School uh, professor, uh, instructed me what my summer job would be in the summer of 2000, uh, 2000, in the summer of uh, 1993. Um, from there, every job that I've had and I've spent, with the exception of the title company, my entire career in public service, um, the skills that I received working at the title company um, uh, landed me an opportunity at Corp Council. I spent 19 years at Corp Council uh, in an area of law, very, very narrow acquisition of property by eminent domain. Uh, I always like to say that nobody goes to law school saying that they want to uh, practice in that very narrow area, but um, it was an amazing experience. I got to work with some incredible attorneys. And again, uh, just through networking at uh, the New York City Law Department, I got my next career that sort of happened um, just because of Hurricane Sandy. So um, you can never really predict the trajectory of your career, um, but again, that opportunity opened up to me um, because of a hurricane, and I became the general counsel at the Governor's Office of Storm Recovery, um, and then became the executive director there. Um, my work there, working on large-scale infrastructure construction projects, got me my next job, which was as the general counsel of the CUNY Construction Fund. Um, you know, so I've worked in many different areas of real estate, one sort of leading to the next. Um, when I was at CUNY, uh, NYCHA has had a, a very large shift in the way that they are approaching affordable housing and really sort of reimagining what affordable housing in New York City looks like. Um, just to put NYCHA in context, NYCHA is the largest um, city housing authority in the country. We are larger than the next 12 public housing authorities put together. Um, our Office of General Counsel has 150 lawyers. Um, and we handle just an incredible, you know, bunch of issues from torts to contracts to um, legal counsel. So, um, but every single job that I've had um, has, um, I've gotten through networking. And I think if you meet somebody, especially graduates of Brooklyn Law School, um, I'm an undergraduate, uh, I have my undergraduate degree from Villanova, um, people routinely reach out to me to say, hey, I'm interested in this. And even if it's not real estate, I will always spend time, um, whether it's an email or a quick phone call or connecting people. I'll say, send you my resume, send me your resume. And I'm happy to do that. And I think you'll find, especially with a school like Brooklyn Law School, where we're not necessarily connected to a university, we take such pride in our school and the education that we receive there that we're always happy, even if we can't offer you a job, we can we can try to instruct you um, of the different pathways you might want to take. That is an amazing uh, summation of, I think, so many different things. First of all, Lisa, thank you for, for talking about how networking is so important, but also giving us a little bit about your trajectory Again, lemons to lemonade is the ultimate uh, superstorm Sandy uh, response into what you're doing now at the Housing Authority, and really just a tremendous uh, piece of advice to all of you out there that Brooklyn Law School is 
us, right? There's no football team. There's no uh, basketball. We're not going to the NCAA tournament. We are Brooklyn Law School. So anytime I hear from someone, and I want to uh, hear from all of you, and title companies lead to great successes, as as uh, Lisa pointed out, and everyone knows hashtag I love title. Um, the reality is that we are there for you. The alumni base of Brooklyn Law School and the Alumni Association and uh, the alumni board, which I serve on, all we talk about is how much we want to give back to all of our alumni. So thank you for shedding light on that. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Car- Carl uh, Dowden, who is the most recent of our graduates. I didn't give anyone else's graduating year. Uh, but Carl is a recent graduate who has put out his own shingle, uh, Carl Dowden Law, PLLC. So, Carl, why don't you give us a little bit about your background and how you ended up deciding to practice uh, as a solo practitioner? Absolutely. And first of all, I'd like to say thank you to Brooklyn Law School for having me. I'm honored to be here, and thank you, everyone, for attending. Um, initially, when I first graduated from Brooklyn Law School, I graduated in 2013, so it was a couple of years after the Great Recession and all of that. I started out working at, as a postgraduate fellow for the New York State Attorney General's Office, and I was able to get that opportunity because of my contributions as a student committee member at the New York City Housing and Urban Development Committee. So I, had, uh, I was interested in affordable housing at the time. And I volunteered to join as a student member. And the chair of the committee at the time was also the chair of the Real Estate Finance Bureau. So she liked my contributions. And when I asked for the opportunity to work as a postgraduate fellow, she was absolutely thrilled. So um, after that, I was able to get an opportunity to work at Alma Realty Corp., which whose general counsel and um, one of the principals of the company are both Brooklyn Law School alumni. And and I actually got that opportunity through a former classmate of mine in my same year who was working for them right after law school. And he reached out to me and he said, hey, hey, if you're still looking for a job, I know someone, or I know my company's hiring. Initially, um, they're hiring for collections, but maybe things will change over the next few months and you might get an opportunity to do more diverse types of practices. At the time, you know, it seemed like a very promising offer to work in-house, especially to law school, essentially. So I took him up on it, and lo and behold, a few months later, I did get the opportunity to do a lot of the commercial leasing for the management company, and that was some pretty invaluable experience, and it, it, show, it exposed me to a field of law that I found very, very interesting, and it was quite um, an enjoyable experience that was just kind of following opportunities. So after doing that for about two years, I moved to a firm in Midtown Manhattan where I was able to do commercial leasing on behalf of both landlords and tenants. And I obtained that position through Craigslist, which I will say on a very general note, it has some very serious hits and misses. And for the sake of brevity, I will not go into them right now. But after another two years of working at that small law firm, I had the opportunity. I was at the point where I started, or I wasn't learning as much as I once did when I was first working there. So I re- evaluated what I wanted to do with my career. Uh, the stars sort of aligned for me to have the opportunity to open my own firm. I was planning on buying a house, but uh, it was a seller's market. I won't say it's anywhere near as much of a seller's market as it is today, but it felt that way as someone who was uh, trying to buy and so I had money for a down payment, which was which was converted to a runway for my uh, law firm because if things started, if I took off slowly, then I would need to tap into that and all. Um, I was also getting married at the time, around the same time as I made the decision, so I was able to get health insurance. And you know, at the time, it was just kind of like, if I'm already looking for a job, then worst case scenario, I fail and I have to find another job and I'll be back right, right back where I was. So that bug got into my head. I couldn't take it out. And that was, and two years ago, I made the leap. Amazing. Amazing. I, again, you're the most recent graduate and the only one that is, from what I can see, uh, running their own law firm, uh, which is 
truly commendable, but also I, it sounds like you like big challenges. You're getting married, you're buying a house, and you're starting a law firm all in the same breath. That's wow. Uh, so Carl is and, – and he found a job on Craigslist that actually worked out to some degree. Uh, so those are all amazing, amazing little tidbits, and I'm sure Carl will give us more as we go into the Q&A. Uh, but from Craigslist to Craig Price is where we're heading. Uh, Craig is a partner at Belkin, Burden, and Goldman, and it's a real estate-only law firm that is truly uh, one of the top in the whole New York City uh, law firm world, specifically – as they, they deal with every facet of real estate law and they do it at a very high level. And I'm lucky enough to work with them on a lot of things. And I've known Craig for a number of years. Uh, we did not meet at Brooklyn Law School, but Craig has been one of my biggest advocates and truly looked out for me at every turn. So I thank you, Craig, for that. And I turn it over to you to talk about how you ended up at Belkin Burden. As I said, a real estate only mid-sized firm in Manhattan. Yeah, thanks, Tim. Um, I, I, when I, when I, where I am today is not where I started. I will say that for sure. Um, you know, I was born in Brooklyn and came back from the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, to be close to home again and be back in Brooklyn. And I got admitted to Brooklyn Law School and was grateful for the ability to be back home, to be with, back with my people. Uh, and, um, when I was in my, after my first year of law school, like everybody, I sought my first uh, legal job. I was fortunate enough that one of my former camp counselors had a small real estate, uh, a small firm that was a, you know, general practice, three partners. Um, they basically were just trying to get whatever business they could get into the door and they gave me the opportunity to be a summer intern. Uh, probably within the first week of being there, one of the partners walked in and said, you're going to be my real estate guy. He said to me, here's a contract. We're going to close this deal. Um, little did I know that he didn't know anything more than I knew about real estate, but I needed to figure it out. And I somehow managed to figure out how to close a co-op and buy a co-op for the client. And I learned the nuts and bolts of the transaction, literally baptism by fire. Um, it was probably the best thing that ever happened to me because along the way during that summer and into the following year, I learned of all the different areas that one could go into in the real estate field, which I think is important for people listening in because there are so many avenues for you to travel down. It's not just law. Um, and I got involved learning how to become a title closer. I learned how to um, work through different banks, uh, bank attorney's offices, how to do all the, all the different areas of how to be a real estate practitioner uh, while I was actually going into while I was going to school at Brooklyn for the second year of law school in the third year, I pretty much worked more than I went to school. Um, again, sitting in all the various seats by virtue of networking and meeting people in the end of my by the end of my second year of law school, I actually took a position with a firm that did strictly residential lending bank work. Um, and at that time, believe it or not, interest rates were really, really low. It was um, the late 90s, early 2000, and interest rates were 7.5%. They came all the way down from 12.5%. People were so excited that they were so low that everybody was refinancing. So I was literally doing six to seven closings a day. And that was great and wonderful because I really got to see the good, the bad, and the ugly of how to practice. I sat around a lot of closing tables sitting in the chair as bank attorney in one day, another day while I was, in, you know, being a title closer. And then I was, was offered a position to come back to work after law school at this same banking firm. Uh, but for various reasons, um, mostly having to do with the compensation structure that I was, that I was promised when I got back, um, that didn't seem to pan out. And within two weeks of taking the position and seeing my first paycheck, I, um, gratefully extended my hand to the partner who had given me the job and told me what my deal was going to be and said, thank you, but I don't think I can work here anymore because this isn't what we agreed to. It wasn't at that time probably the smartest thing to say, um, but it was the best decision I ever made because over the two weeks notice that I'd given him, I had taken my Rolodex and it was a literal Rolodex back in the day, um, not on the computer. Uh, filled with business cards of all the real estate practitioners, title companies, brokers that I had met. 
And I leveraged that Rolodex into the opportunity to close per diem on the title closing basis and basically continuing to do what I did. Um, along the way, um, I was able to, within two weeks, I had a full schedule. Um, and I needed a place to work. So a good friend of mine own, owned a bagel store near my apartment where I was living at the time. And uh, I basically made that bagel store my office. And I was able to, uh, through, nav through networking, create a settlement business, a closing business, where I represented um, the banks and the title companies all in one and uh, hired a bunch of my parents' friends who became notaries and started a business that basically closed uh, lines of credits and other types of loans. Uh, the long and the short of it is, is while I was doing that, I really was being a dispatcher because I wasn't doing all the closings myself. I was just organizing and, and moving things along. And so I was also doing closings for lots of attorneys around New York City. When they couldn't cover their closings, I was covering them for them. One of those days led to the opportunity to sit at a closing table with an attorney on the other side who asked me, how'd you get here? You're 25 years old. Like this is a big apartment, seven and a half million dollars. How'd you get here? And I said, well, you know, and I told him my story and I gave him my card and I said, Hey, if you ever need anyone to do due diligence, I'm happy to do it for you. Really didn't know what due diligence really truly was, but I knew that it was one of the buzzwords that you needed. And that led to four months later, he called me on my office phone again at the bagel store and said, Hey, I got a great opportunity for you. I'd love for you to come join my commercial real estate law firm. Uh, and I think it'd be great for you. I gave up the, uh, the business and decided to go and take the leap because I did go to law school to become a real lawyer. And I spent the next three years in the trenches learning how to practice commercial real estate. And I did deals across the U.S. and New York and learned how to become a multi, multi family practitioner, retail, a, le a leasing uh, attorney. Um, and I was pretty much did that for three, three years when I decided that I was getting a little tired of the law. Um, and just about when I was going to go be, I love title, like my friend, Tim, um, I got a phone call from a headhunter who said, I have a great opportunity for you. Um, there's a great real estate firm in New York city. Who's looking to start a transactional department. And we think you have the skill set that would be that skill set to become one of those people. And, um, I said, okay, I'll listen. Uh, and I did, and I went on an interview, which actually was just a lunch with two of the partners uh, on a Friday afternoon. And um, on Monday, they offered me that position. That is now 17 years ago. Belkin Burden, Goldman, or it was Belkin Burden, Wendy and Goldman, another Brooklyn Law School alumni, um, actually uh, was based on administrative real estate and litigation. And this was the ability to branch out and grow within the firm. And I'm proud to say that some... 17 years later, we're now a transactional department filled with 16 people and 50 uh, real estate practitioners. So that's sort of where I got to today. Wow. That's a great story. As, uh, I, you know, I didn't know all of that until we got to this, uh, amazing panel discussion. So Craig, from a, from a schmear on a bagel store to running transactions all over the country and, really being a go-to person for me and for many, many uh, owner operators, developers uh, in real estate uh, here in New York uh, and nationally, as you said. But now we're going to turn to a professor, a real live professor that has audio that works, um, Richard Sobelson, uh, to talk about his practice area in-house, uh, a little bit about his how he ended up at Cohen Brothers Realty Corporation. And also those of you on the call that had Professor Sobelson know that he is one of the truly nicest people I've had the fortune, great fortune of becoming friends with in the real estate community here in New York. Um, so Richard, uh, Professor Sobelson, could you please give us a little bit of your journey as all the other panelists have prior to you? Okay, thanks for the intro, Tim. And I guess I'll have to send you your monthly check for my PR work. Um, so when I went to Brooklyn Law School, I was running my own business. Um, and when I graduated, I hang out, hung out a shingle and I practiced on my own for a couple of years. The business I was running was a real estate, insurance, and tax school. And I thought I had, you know, 
all these thousands of clients that would just come to me um, for work, and that would be it. Um, and I was wearing two hats for a few years, didn't do justice to either of them, loved practicing law, and closed the family business, continued to practice on my own for another year, and then there was an opening as general counsel in a real estate development firm, a very small one, to Israelis, um, where I really learned the ropes. It's really where I got my introduction and my the beginning of my sophisticated training. I worked there for about four years, and then there was an opening at Strook, Strook, and Levan. They were looking for uh, the 50th attorney. There were 49 attorneys before me in the real estate practice group. And um, I was hired by a Brooklyn Law alum, and I worked there for a while. Uh, great experience. It's a great firm. I wasn't getting enough finance experience when I was there. And there was an opening at a firm called K. Scholler, where they had 40 attorneys in their real estate practice group and 39 just did lending work. Um, and I worked at K. Scholler for a while. And then um, I, I enjoyed the lending work, but not solely doing lending work. And then there was an opening um, at Moses and Singer, which is sort of a mid-sized firm, 115 attorneys. And I cold called them. So I sent an email to the managing partner at the time, who was a Brooklyn Law alum. And I said I was looking for a switch. And he said, come on down and talk to us. So I went down there for an interview. And I guess like Craig, I went on a Friday. And on Monday, they offered me a job. And I worked at Moses and Singer for about five years. And then I was recruited um, to work at LexisNexis not in their legal department, to pick, but to create their real estate module for their Lexus Practice Advisor product, new product for transactional attorneys. So I was at LexisNexis for almost five years, and I really missed practicing law. So there was an opening at Cohen Brothers Realty Corporation. I interviewed there and uh, almost four years ago. And... Uh, they offered me the job, and I took it. And my current practice is, I'd say, mostly leasing because we're a landlord of 15 million square feet across the country. But the guy I work for is involved in a lot of different things. We own movie theaters, so I also practice on the tenant side. We own a lot of retail, so I also practice on the tenant side. Uh, we've got a hotel. Um, and the guy I work for is a Brooklyn Law alum, super smart. Um, so that's where I've been for almost four years. Well, thank you. And I, I will, uh, show, show off that I, I do have a virtual, uh, image of, of Charles to back up my, uh, so you could pretend like he's with us during this, uh, great natured, uh, discussion. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to the last of our, uh, esteemed panel and then we're going to do some question and answer. I will, offer uh that we're already at 640 uh so i want everyone to start chatting on the chat room with questions that molly dresher can then uh curate for us so uh please keep those questions coming those pledges are very important to us now the questions are very important to us uh we would love to see more questions from the audience we're really here for you this is a a Debbie's brainchild with the help of Caitlin, myself, Molly, and the entire panel. We want to answer your questions and concerns. So that's why we're here today. All right. So we're going to turn it over, uh, uh, to, to Nikki and, uh, Sismanakis. And I, I, I butchered the name, even though my, my name, Overwager, is easily butchered as well. Uh, but Nikki is, uh, a partner at Goldstein Hall and, um, uh, I got a one little correction. The Q and A portion, not the chat portion, is where you're sending those uh, those questions. So, Nikki, uh, while people are typing away at their home computers, you're going to give us your background and how you ended up at Goldstein Hall. Um, you know, it looks like you you really have had an amazing ride uh, from. Queens via St. John's University 
to Brooklyn and now to Manhattan with all of these amazing jobs that I've, I've now looked up uh, on your way. So why don't you, Nikki, give us your, your journey? Hi, everybody. Thank you for having me. And thanks to Professor Bechtel, or Debbie, as everybody knows her, um, for inviting me to join the panel. I graduated Brooklyn Law School in 2011. I was a student during the Lehman Brothers collapse and uh, also struggled in um, rebounding and finding a job to allow that actually was able to rebound from it. Um, I basically took the position of doing as many internships as possible while in law school uh, to gain knowledge on different fields. I didn't go to law school thinking that I would be interested in real estate, but that quickly became my focus. The law school developed the Certificate of Real Estate Law, and I joined that program and got the certificate. And I also pretty quickly and fortunately um, met with Professor Bechtel and learned about her clinical opportunities. Uh, so when I was in law school, the Corporate and Real Estate Clinic was there. It's over 20 years old now. And they also started the transactional externship. And I literally got an email in my first year summer from Professor Bechtel uh, inviting students who are interested to apply for the corporate and real estate clinic program or the externship. And I did just that. And it basically led me through different areas of real estate in different environments. So I, I interned at a not-for-profit. I interned at a law firm that had a strong transactional background. I also interned at a law firm that had a litigation background. Uh, quasi-governmental, the biggest municipal bond financing agency in the country, uh, and uh, also had the opportunity to actually participate in an in-house clinic of Professor Bechtel's, the corporate and real estate clinic. And through those experience, I, experiences, I learned what I liked and what I didn't like, and it helped lead me towards a path forward. When I was in law school, there were a lot more litigation jobs available than transaction transactional. And it turned out that I actually developed an interest in transactional law compared to litigation and was fortunate enough to get a job out of law school and start uh, at a law firm where I was previously an intern, which is Goldstein Hall. Uh, Goldstein Hall is an, uh, a law firm that was young at the time, but now is almost 15, we're not over 15 years old. And um, they are a group of uh, partners and uh, associates uh, whose special focus is affordable housing. I started off, um, thanks to my background on the right foot, I was able to move pretty quickly in understanding complicated concepts and became in 2019 the first female partner of the firm. I also became uh, the first uh, attorney at the firm to become partner uh, after being starting off as a, basically a law clerk to an associate, to a senior associate. I, I pushed myself through the ranks and have been there ever since. Uh, it's been almost a decade of a great experience there. And I would never have met them, probably. <laughs> I know I definitely would never have met them, uh, but for uh, the introduction from Professor Bechtel. So I'm very grateful to be part of that community, even though uh, the partners at the time were not Brooklyn Law School alums. They were very supportive of Brooklyn Law School and Professor Bechtel's clinical program. And through that relationship, uh, I was able to start and have a job after law school in, in a field that I was interested in and take it from there. Well, Nikki, that's an amazing story, uh, specifically, I think, around the importance of not only the clinical program, but the internship opportunities. So for all the students out there, uh, really take that to heart, because when you look at Nikki's resume, uh, it's tremendously, it's filled with you know, a NYC H, uh, Housing Development Corporation, Enterprise Community Partners, those type of things lead to opportunities with a law firm uh, like Goldstein Hall in a way that really just you can't create that without that background. In other words, those concepts that, that Nikki has, ex has expertise in come from not only the clinical program that Debbie offers, but also um, the internship program. So, I'm a big proponent of that, and I think everyone out there who's a student should should take that to heart, that law school is not only about the classroom environment. Uh, even though Professor Sobelson wants you to focus on his class when you take it, uh, it's not the only thing that matters. Um, so I will turn it back to Nikki because we're going we're gonna to go around the room a little bit. Um, 
you know, we're on the Brady Bunch, so we want other people to ask questions. But I'll start uh, with asking Nikki, can you comment on what you expect to be most busy with in the next year and how has your practice area in um, low-income housing changed since March? And the last part of the three-part question is, how do you expect it to change over the next year? So in the past few months, as you know, um, the city has been reacting to the pandemic. And as a result, the city has moved a lot of financial resources to the recovery and the safety of the community and everybody else. Uh, as a result, uh, the budgets for the city, um, including one of the lead partners that our firm works with, uh, the housing, the Department of Housing Preservation and Development, was slashed significantly. Um, and so at first it was scary, um, but this unfortunately was not the first time that this has ever happened. Uh, the city has rebound, uh, rebounded before from a crisis, and we expect them to do so again. Um, but there was a period where things were put on hold um, unless you were focusing on converting existing loans or refinancing. Um, the consequence of the pandemic is that interest rates have gone down, uh, and even though loan terms are a little bit different. Um, and our, a lot of our clients have taken advantage of the lower interest rates, and we are, have a very heavy practice right now on refinancings. Uh, fortunately, the budget passed and there's a little bit more stability in the city knowing what's going on and how to react to coronavirus, uh, that affordable housing closings are continuing. And we, we fortunately have some scheduled and some have already happened, which is great uh, because the city is resilient. Um, but over the next year, I, I think it's going to be a, a lot more of the same, but more uh, refinancings uh, just because our clients are going to take advantage of the loan terms. So uh, I'll springboard over to Lisa because she's at the, the, you know, the New York City Housing Authority. Can you talk to us? Similar question. Where, where are you focusing right now? How has your practice, uh, in-house there changed since March? And what are you focused on? I'm sure the world is, you know, no, nowhere near the same. So just give us a little bit about that. Sure. Um, so the New York City Housing Authority, we actually just announced, um, uh, our transformation plan, a way for us to create more affordable housing. Um, you know, as this pandemic has shown, um, vulnerable populations, especially um, low income or super low income, uh, or people who are moderate income now becoming low income, the need for affordable housing is always going to be there. And quite frankly, it could be an opportunity um, as the commercial market might decline a little bit more opportunities for affordable housing. So we are moving ahead, trying to come forward with creative solutions. Um, I think it's really an opportunity to press the, the federal government, um, especially HUD for more tenant protection vouchers and things like that. So as Nikki said, the city is resilient, right? And as we've seen, um, you know, when I went to Brooklyn Law School, what it looks like now um, is not what it was 25 years ago. I would have to walk from Concord Village on the little median because there was a park that was so dangerous um, that it, it, it was just not as safe as, as it is now. So, you know, what that's to say is that real estate, you know, comes in fits and starts. Um, and um, as we've heard so many different people say, there's always, you know, real estate will go down, real estate will come up. Interest rates will go down, interest rates will go up. So uh, there will always be an opportunity in real estate. And especially for real estate practitioners, uh, because regardless of pricing, regardless of interest rates, there's still a need for wisdom and knowledge and wherewithal. Absolutely. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Craig Price, being that we, we're so lucky to have him. Uh, he's actually taking a couple of days with his family next week, even though he has what he told me was seven closings in the next few days. So tell us what you're working on, Craig, and how someone like yourself has been so prolific in such a tough time. Um, I think that part of it is, is that, you know, you know, fortunately, 
there was a period of time going into the pandemic that the, our pipelines were all pretty healthy. I mean, so I spent the first part of the pandemic, March, April, and a part of May, really getting those deals that were already in contract um, closed. And a lot of those deals that were in contract were pushed off, um, quite honestly. They were renegotiated. Times, timelines were uh, and dates were changed in contracts and moved out. So a lot, a bunch of the deals that I'm closing over the next uh, two weeks are actually some deals that were pre-COVID that are just closing now. And those are, that's more on the commercial side. Um, but I will say that over the last, but over the last five to six weeks, there has been an uptick in activity as we've entered phase two and three and now four in the city. Um, you know, activity has increased. And so we've seen a lot more activity especially on the residential side uh, with uh, townhomes moving, uh, m- m- apartments are moving, coughs and condos. So we've been, been able to keep busy and do that type of work. Uh, the truth is, is that as a firm, we've been able to sort of come back to life because on the litigation fronts, the courts have finally opened. So things have gotten busier. Uh, and we also deal with the rent laws. Um, it's interesting. I, I heard a statistic that the vacancy rates are, are saying are close to eight, eight to ten percent in New York City, um, which you know, it may not be a housing emergency anymore in New York. But you know, if not, you know, the rent laws certainly are going to be looked at for that reason. You know, over the next you know next year or so, as we see where the city goes. Well, that could be another uh, amazing forum, being that we have uh, a faculty member. I'll leave him nameless, who's very involved in all of that. So. Uh, maybe Craig is foreshadowing for our next uh, panel discussion. Bob, I saw you nodding during the Craig's uh, pipeline discussion. Talk to us about how big law is dealing with, I'm sure you're happier working at home. I'm sure the hours are the same, but uh, at least you're home. Uh, tell us about how you're responding and how your transactions are starting to, to, to happen again. Well, I think, I think you raised an important point. I think, and there was, I think the first question to pop up in the Q&A was with office workers transitioning to remote work, how is this going to impact commercial real estate? I certainly don't have a crystal ball, but I can say, speak with my colleagues and certainly I think many of the people on this call and panelists would agree is that rumors of the work from home utopia are greatly exaggerated. Um, Working from home has a lot of challenges, uh, especially not just for, but especially for people with young children or school age children. Um, There's also a, a significant status quo bias in all types of real estate behavior. Certainly developer friends and clients would agree. Um, There's enormous excitement and energy being deferred into when we're all going to be back. And a lot of the behavior that I'm seeing in my own practice is just as the world was in 2008 predicated on this idea that even though the world never goes back to normal, certainly when the pandemic is over, we're all planning on the world being largely restored to a lot uh, to the way it looked yesterday i closed a construction loan for a shopping mall and you know everyone is saying that those don't why would that even exist right now it everything is going to kind of adjust to what we know there are huge structural problems in the residential market, for example, that simply won't allow everyone to get out of the city and own a house and telework. It's just, it's, it's just not possible. So people are, I see with tenants in our, with the landlords I represent, um, deferment is very common because everyone's just kind of eyeballing what's happening and the timelines and saying, well, when, when will this tenant be back with the income stream to pay rent? There are tons of retailers in restructuring that, um, honestly, a lot of people think might have, should have been there sooner before the pandemic, but they're restructuring and eventually they're going to come out and we're going to know what's going to happen to all those leases that they may or may not reject. But fundamentally, um, 
the spirit and the deals that we've been doing are in a spirit, as Craig was saying, of changing timelines, extending timelines, altering deal terms, supplying credit enhancements to get things done either now or when things, as things continue to improve economically so that the world is kind of, while there are pauses here and there, things are largely setting up to go back to as close to what they were like before as they can be. And maybe some tech companies will work from home forever, but that's, we, we all know that that's what they wanted to do. Um, so they have the opportunity now, but certainly all my partners want to get back to the office. We want to be holding our thousand page stacks of papers and closing binders. So we're not anxious and we want to be training associates. And I think that we are going to be back as soon as we can. All right. Well, I, I, I have to turn it over to Richard because first he's a professor and I've made him wait, which is really embarrassing. But second, second, uh, I also think Bob is also just trying to get to the point that he can't wait to move into one Vanderbilt, uh, SL Green's newest building, uh, you know, right around, very similar, uh, nearby where a lot of your company owns a lot of office buildings, et cetera. So tell us the owner's perspective on what's going on and then maybe just a little bit of a uh tidbit on on green uh building and what and how the pandemic is is going to change that course as well okay tim so that's right i think we're gonna have a new normal you know it'll be a different normal uh i think one of the the great attributes of a brooklyn law alum and its students is that you're versatile, we're versatile, we can adapt. I mean, if you listen to everybody who spoke tonight, uh, they didn't just have one, you know, solid trajectory. There were a bunch of different things that we did, and that's how we got to where we From the landlord's perspective, it, it's kind of, it's weird right now. There are some tenants that are, you know, they're worrying about what their new normal will be, and there are other tenants that are saying, well, if, in fact, in the short term, we're going to be bringing people back to the office, maybe, in fact, we need more space. So I'm actually pretty busy in my office on the landlord side, not reviewing, you know, sublease requests, but, but you know, negotiating new leases, sometimes with existing tenants and sometimes with brand new tenants, that... Uh, you know, who knows what the terms will be. Sometimes they're all over the place, but in many cases, there are existing tenants wanting to take more space because for the short term, they see that they're going to need that. Um, touching upon sustainability, it's, it's really, you know, COVID has been good for green buildings. It's been good for green buildings because the, um, the concept behind sustainable building is healthier occupants in a building. And with COVID, you know, think about it. That's sort of the bottom line. We've got to make sure whoever's in the offices have to be safe. So uh, the green building component um, throughout the world, but definitely in the United States, and I see from our buildings, um, we're pushing green a great deal. And there are loads of other landlords that my boss speaks to on a regular basis that are doing the same just because of that. Because if you know you're going into a green building, it's going to be a better building. Yeah, and I, I, I was I, I was inspired by you years ago. I became a lead AP, and I remember that from the exam, that one of the big components is healthier uh, employees and healthier tenants as one of the purposes of, of lead. So uh, we don't have to go down that route. If you want to hear anything more about sustainability and you want to take – Professor Sobelson's class in that area, you know, there, there, there are opportunities in the, I don't know when he's teaching it next, but, uh, I'll leave that as my infomercial for the day. I'm now going to cede control of this whole Zoom to one of my favorite people on planet Earth, Molly Drescher, uh, cause Molly has been going through the Q and A function and calling out the most important questions to our panelists. So, Molly, it's 7.01. It's your time, and uh, it's off to the races. Thank you. Thank you, Tim, and thanks to the panelists for providing us some insight into your backgrounds and the industry right now. Uh, a lot of the questions that have come in are about the market and remote work, so I think that's been answered. But one of them that I saw was, 
what specific skills or experiences should a young attorney be seeking while beginning their careers? What will make them most marketable? Maybe Carl, you could provide some insight into that. Sure. Um, I'll just say the first thing which came to my mind while uh, I heard the question, which is consider looking at um, getting experience with um, foreclosure defense. I mean, that is a field which is very popular, which, which was very busy in the years post the Great Recession. And unfortunately, uh, the cards, it seems likely that that's going to be a big uh, factor. Well, there'll be a big, there'll be a spike in foreclosure defense as a result of COVID and all of the fallout associated with it. And then otherwise, I'll echo Nikki's comment about um, getting as much experience as you can. Networking, you've heard a lot about the fact that your network can lead to career results. So definitely keep in mind um, your network and try to, to keep a track of it. And one thing is that Brooklyn Law School doesn't keep your emails forever. So if you are meeting people and you are using your school email, make sure that you save that contact information elsewhere. Great advice. Molly, uh, any, any other great questions? First of all, Grant's great advice. I've had mul- – Molly knows firsthand. I've had multiple email accounts in my career in title insurance, and losing someone's contact information is really very bad. So the best way that I solve it is that I link in with everyone. So I have over 8,500 LinkedIn uh, friends and not-so-close friends, but – uh, I use LinkedIn as, as my portal. And so I think that's a great solution. Molly, what, what else is out there in the world of Q&A? Um, another question that's a little bit related. Um, do you have any advice for what students can do while in law school to prepare them to work on the transactional side, transactional side of real estate rather than litigation? All right, we're going to go to the room. All right, Lisa, go for it. Honestly, I, I think we have three people, Craig, Tim, and myself, who all started in the title industry. And I have to tell you, even now, well, first of all, it's my first love. Um, and you learn so much about real estate by working on the title side, whether you're – Lisa, reader, whether just you're just coach. to add to that, Molly also worked in title, so don't leave her out. Oh, my God. Started. Okay, well, look, look at this. I started as a title abstractor. When oh, I was you're born. kidding. Yeah. And I have to tell you, all roads lead back to real estate, titles, uh, how to read a survey, how to understand the relationship between a piece of property and a street. You know, whether it's a real street, whether it's a paper street, you know, whether the owners on either side have rights to the street, a dollar condemnation clause. I mean, and I get really excited talking about this because I think I'm a title wonk, but it's so interesting. And honestly, anything um, when you're dealing with real estate in the city of New York, and all roads lead back to title. And just a quick story, um, after 9-11, uh, the World Trade Center site was acquired by Eminent Domain, you know, in a, a really, really long time ago, you know, I, I think in the 60s. But there were all the streets within the city, within the World Trade Center site that were owned by the city of New York that were discontinued but never transferred to, to look behind Tim, uh, transferred to the Port Authority. And when the towers came down, all uh, the city, the Port Authority, um, Tim's friend, we all had to get into a room and figure out how to facilitate that transfer. And for somebody like me, a title long, it was so interesting because it was something that nobody would have ever thought of. You know, who owns a street from heaven to hell? Who has subterranean rights? So I have to tell you, if I was in law school and, you know, unfortunately, Professor Crea has gone on to greener pastures, um, this is an, um, not widely known part of real estate, but it's such an integral part. Um, and that to me would be, uh, the most advantageous, um, job. I have Craig. Craig, jump in. Go for it. 
No, I have to agree. I mean, to me, I always say that, you know, I call myself a tweener because I do both residential and commercial real estate. And I always do, I've always continued, even as I do mostly commercial work now, I I always have a healthy, uh, you know, caseload of residential deals because I think it's the nuts and bolts of any practitioner. As a law student, it's really, like I said, I really was throwing a file and said, figure it out. I think Josh Seikoff, um, who is a legal, uh, who, who is one of our, our legal clerks at law clerks at Falcon Burton is on this. Um, he was, he's a Brooklyn law school student. I believe he's, he's watching now. Um, listen, he came in, uh, you know, from Brooklyn law school with far more skills than I ever had. And it was a lot because of the practical uh, experience that, you, that Brooklyn offers now. But I will say, and I think it's important now in the COVID land for whoever's listening right now, you have a bunch of people on this panel. Every one of you should be reaching out to each one of us after this is done and asking to talk to us. I guarantee you that every one of us will speak to you, will talk to you, will Zoom with you, will FaceTime with you. If we were in person, I, I'd take you to lunch. We'd have a conversation. I'd learn about you. You'd learn about me. That's the way that in New York you're going to learn. I will also put out there that a fellow Brooklyn Law grad who is a broker on a transaction I am working on, heard I was doing this and said, please let them know that if anyone wants to go into the brokerage world or is just looking for a job, I would love to talk to them because I'm looking for someone. So if you're interested in just seeking an opportunity, you never know this is a new, you know, this is a new world we're in. I've just put it out there for you. Craig, thank you. That's an amazing uh, tidbit. I, you know, I think people are much more open to cold call, connected cold calls right now because we're all working from home and we have, you know, a little bit of that distant relationship that we're seeking those one-on-one opportunities, even with new people that we don't know, but we're connected to through a Brooklyn Law School. So I think right now is your time. So go for it. Um, I want to turn it over to, to Bob. He, he wanted to potentially add, I think, something as to Molly's question. Maybe, Molly, you have another question for Bob about something uh, cooking uh, with GT. Or is he, he's still itching to get back to the new, the new office building they're moving into, I think. Bob, go ahead. Um, where do you want me to start, Molly? What, which, whatever you want to talk about is fine. Well, I was, Your love for title abstracting, you were saying. I, uh, I, uh, I, I started as a title abstractor. I think that that's a great um, skill to know. I, I remember um, in, in, real, in real property, I remember a, a note that said uh, in one of the case books, it said, you know, who has, time to, who has time to talk about contingent remainders when Chinese metaphysics has yet to be explored? And I, I did. I really, really did have time to think about contingent remainders. And, you know, when you're, when you're in a law firm, I can certainly say the dirt practice at GT, um, as, as Molly knows from having worked with me, um, if you are the kind of uh, attorney who can get your hands dirty and read a survey and look at a title report and have maybe the AIA guide to New York on your desk and, and know exactly what that property neighbors are and who built it and who designed it. Those little details um, really make a difference. Um, being interested in what's happening on the ground uh, really does uh, leave an impression on other people in the industry because people in the industry love real estate and you really like to know this stuff. So uh, that's, that's all I would say to answer that. And Richard, maybe you can offer before we go on, uh, Tim, oh, Craig, go, go for it. I just want to say to Bob's point, as a practitioner over 20 years, I have to say that kindness to your fellow practitioners and your adversaries is priceless. It is invaluable because today it's you, tomorrow it's them, and you're going to need each other. So when you practice, whenever that is, just practice with kindness and the mindset of we're all in this together. We're really not. And, you know, against each other. That's a great point. I think having been to many a closing, the ones that work out are the ones where everyone works together. Uh, the ones that don't, there's an adversarial tone from the, from the get go. Uh, all right. I'm going to go to, uh, Rick, for, actually, let me go to Nikki 
because she actually had another question that she she posed to me, uh, and that is, what are the plans for networking in this COVID universe? How are you sort of accomplishing the networking piece besides this great call that, that Debbie came up with, with the help of Caitlin and Richard and every one of you? Uh, Nikki, tell us a little bit about your plans and how you're networking right now. So on a personal level, like on behalf of the firm, we are engaging in a lot more activities and webinars, uh, hosting webinars and uh, connecting with groups that we already have relationships with to try to expand our network. Um, and we've done several of them already, and I have a couple more in the next couple months uh, that you know I'm leading in partnership with people that I already know to expand my you know, my personal and professional network. Uh, but I've also had the opportunity to be, to have some students and recent grads actually shoot me an email, send me an email and saying, hey, here's my resume. Do you have a few moments to talk to me about my resume, any questions or any comments that you have on it or any advice that you have for someone who's going through what I'm going through now? And, you know, it doesn't hurt me to take 20 minutes of my time or half an hour of my time uh, to chat with someone who's currently interning somewhere else during their lunch break and uh, introduce myself and uh, get to know a little bit about them and give them a little bit of tips and tricks saying like, oh, are you interested in not-for-profit work? Have you considered working with um, the New York City Housing Development Corporation? Uh, that's a huge lending facility. Uh, and I, I need me to, I can try to make a connection, those types of things. I, I definitely have no problem doing that. Uh, I feel like because Brooklyn Law School isn't connected to a university, uh, the alumni are closer to each other and feel the loyalty there is strong. Um, and anytime someone from Brooklyn Law applies or reaches out, uh, take a moment and respond to them. And that's that's been pretty great. I've done it a few times already. Yeah, and I, you know, just as a little bit of a plug for the uh, Alumni Association, there has been, and I guess, Caitlin, I don't know if you can speak on behalf of this, there has been really an effort, given the COVID-19 situation, to create a database of people that can be reached out to, and we could circulate that to all the attendees, anyone who uh, who attended this call, because we're wrapping up shortly, uh, can reach out to anyone who has volunteered to provide any type of guidance they can. I got a call uh, last week from someone who's not even in real estate, wants to work in entertainment law. And I spoke to her for half an hour and I, you know, went through my whole, you know, anyone that I knew that was a Brooklyn grad or a graduate of her uh, undergraduate. And we made a number of introductions. Maybe I'll end it here with going back to the professor to end it. Uh, professor Sobelson, now that, you know, Professor Bechtel never got a chance to speak, you'll speak on behalf of professors all, uh, all of them. Talk to us about students that come to you uh, that had taken your class or you had known through other, uh, you know, uh, potential uh, opportunities at the law school and how involved you've been uh, historically just in terms of giving career guidance. I know you've given me a lot of advice. Just talk about how to engage with you and other faculty members for those of the people on the call that are looking for guidance. So the first bit of advice I give, and if anybody on the line has taken any of my courses, you know that within the first 15 minutes of introducing any of the courses I teach at Brooklyn, I always recommend taking any clinic, but in particular Debbie's clinic, um, and I call out her clinic because I took her clinic, her first clinic, um, and I thought it was invaluable. But but anyway, and, and Nikki and Lisa, everybody on the call tonight mentioned that the way to get practical experience that Brooklyn now facilitates is invaluable. And if you don't take advantage of that, you're losing a great deal. I, I took the judicial clinic when I was at Brooklyn, and right after I was admitted, I had no trepidation appearing in court. I was three weeks after, you know, being admitted, and I was in court. Uh, I haven't litigated for many, many years, but going to what Craig said, you know, even your adversaries in the litigation field, you know, the best times were when I had a case that was over with and I went out for a beer with my, my adversary. Because you're right, you're going to see this person later on. The other bit of advice, and maybe this is one way to end, is not only to rely on Brooklyn Law School. I, I think we should all rely on Brooklyn Law School. I think Brooklyn Law School alums 
are probably the strongest source. But I think you're, and, and you'd be remiss in not looking to your undergraduate and taking a look if you have anybody in the undergraduate network that might be able to help you. There are so many students that I speak to that only think about the law school. A home run is when you find somebody that not only went to your undergraduate uh, university or college, but also went to Brooklyn Law School. You can't get better than that. Um, and I, um, I, 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 I have, I'll even add to that. I'm sorry. I'm a little bit loud. Even those of you who have high school connections, I'm working with Jeff Margulies right now on a number of small transactions. We went to the same high school and the same law school. So you got to go use your whole network. Throw the whole kitchen sink in it. I couldn't agree with you more, Richard. Thank you, Professor. Uh, Molly Drescher has one last question. I don't know who she's giving it to, but I'd say it's the whole group. I'm not going to say another word. So Molly Drescher, the floor is yours. Um, so the last question is, what are the biggest opportunities created by this market that you don't think we should let slip past? Creative new deals, new businesses, residential sales, et cetera. I think that I'll start, I'll, I'll start with Richard because I cut him off. So go ahead, Richard. Keep going. All right. You didn't necessarily cut me off. Um, so I think that there's a tremendous amount of opportunity now, and I'm sure that, you know, Carl and Craig and, and Bob and Nikki see the, um, because the interest rates are so much lower now and because prices in some properties have dropped, you know, uh, a good percentage, that there are people out there that have held on to cash for a little while, like even Warren Buffett decided to invest, um, and he was holding on to cash for a while. So there are a lot of developers that are out there. Um, so if you take a look at Glassdoor, if you take a look at LinkedIn, Indeed, you, you know, you should be getting these listservs every single day showing you what jobs that are out there. And some of them are willing to hire somebody that's a recent grad. So I'll end with that, Tim. All right. We're going to go around to everyone. So this will be the last question. Why don't we go in for me in uh, clockwise or whatever it is. Uh, Bob, you're up next on my clockwise uh Zoom, go for it, Bob. Tell us where the opportunities are going forward. I think some of the, one of the biggest opportunities that you guys have now is you have all the more reason to be in studying as hard as you can. Because in my experience, being smart and knowing the law cover to cover is going to come back to you tenfold, no matter where you land in any part of your practice. When I was in a recession, I put in resumes, countless resumes, wherever I could. And sometimes, sometimes you hit and sometimes you don't, but institutions have a long memory. So if you're looking at a big law firm, apply to the big law firms just like you did before and keep at it. But while you're in, while things are, while you're worried about getting sick or covering up or taking care of your family, study all harder because it's, I promise you, the more you know, the more successful you will be. Love it. Carl, you're, you're next on the, uh, on the Zoom, uh, cl clockwise. Go for it. Yep. Yeah. So I think I mentioned, um, you know, considering foreclosure defense, it's, that's going to be a field. Um, otherwise, just keep an eye on the market. See, try to read the news. Um, I'll echo what Bob had said about keeping, um, all of her, but uh, I believe it was Bob said about keeping all of your alerts active so that you can see what jobs are available. And then um, just put yourself out there, risk the rejection because, you know, it's, it's something that you just have to get used to, especially as an attorney, you're not going to win everything that you try. And um, if you don't ever try, then you, know, you can't be surprised if you don't get what you didn't ask for. So um, keep at it, work hard, try to network and try to stay informed. Love it. Lisa, you're, you're next on the list and I'll, I'll try to keep myself low profile. I, I'm not putting myself out there anymore. So. <laughs> um, I would say right now you have such an incredible opportunity for networking. Um, like Tim said earlier, right now, because we're all working from home and I don't know if everyone feels the same, there is no logical starter end to my work day. So I can do a call at 7 a.m. or 11 o'clock at night. So I have more flexibility now because I'm not commuting because 
I'm already surrounded by my family. So taking a call, doing a Zoom call, uh, you know, shooting an email, at, depending on what, what the time is, doesn't really make a difference. Plus, you have the ability to network the, the way that I did in 25 years ago. You can literally be sitting in sweats, set, you know, linking in with people, as Kim said. Link in, reach out. There are people who want to help. And as I will say, as I say to everyone who I help out, pay it forward. Right, right now you're starting your career, but 25 years from now, when you're settled in, you have a great job, make sure you're helping out other Brooklyn Law School graduates. I, I always say karma will bite you in the worst way. If you, if you don't, if you don't pay it forward, uh, then you're not going to be successful. So, exactly. Uh, so Craig, you're, you're next and, uh, and, and I'm impressed. We haven't lost many of you. So. We're still at 54. Don't, don't tune out yet. We got, we got two more people that will let you go to dinner. I have to think back to back to school and like what, what Mr. Mellon would say, you know, look out for number one and don't step in number two. Uh, but no, that's not the advice. I mean, the advice I would give you is that, um, I think a bit of what everyone else has said, you know, certainly use this time right now to, uh, build your core competencies. Um, uh, there are a lot of, um, a lot of companies out there that are doing um, continuing legal education classes, and I know they're continuing legal education classes, but they're really opportunities that you could find through title companies and through brokerage companies that are offering educational experiences for practitioners and non-practitioners. Take as many of them as you possibly can and reach out to those panelists and network with those panelists. Um, that would be number one. And number two, I would say is, is that um, this really is your opportunity to figure out if you really want to practice law. Not everybody wants to practice and not everybody wants to be a real estate lawyer. But if you want to be in the real estate field right now, the two areas that I would tell you that I would look at are administrative real estate law. So governmental agency, anything having to do with uh, the rent laws in New York. I think that over the next five to 10 years, um, I could tell you from our own firm, that will be an area of growth because there is a lot going on in that area. And as um, uh, Carl had said, um, certainly the workout the foreclosure in the bankruptcy world, it's, you know, it's not, it's not a happy thing to say, but it's a reality. That's what's going to be coming down the line. And if you're looking to get into something, that's what I would recommend. All right, Nikki, you're the last of our esteemed panelists to speak, but I'm, uh, I'm excited that we've gotten through this with, as I said, most of our audience still intact, so go for it. My suggestions are to be collaborative and be creative. Sometimes real estate involves reacting. And for example, when the Trump tax laws changed, the equity market in real estate uh, significantly was altered for me in the affordable housing realm. Uh, but now that HPD doesn't have as much uh, subsidy to provide these projects, equity seems to be the name of the game. And so in the course of the past few years, we went from trying to figure out ways to uh, deal with the fact that we don't have equity to now relying on uh, a lot of equity. And that's New York. Uh, it's the roller coaster. Uh, but again, I think as long as you work with people and try to figure out different ways to be creative and structure your projects more uh, a little bit differently than you had anticipated, and as long as you're working with people who are willing to work with you to do that, then you will be successful. Well, that's an amazing uh, way to finish, and I, I can't thank all of you, every one of you, uh, not only the panelists, uh, but obviously my co-host, Molly Drescher, and the amazing Debbie Bechtel. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't say that uh, Caitlin Monk was thanked by Debbie in her remarks, and I, who speak to Caitlin pretty regularly, did not thank her, so... Uh, Debbie has extended thank yous and I extend a thank you to Caitlin for helping us put this together. Um, so thank you all for joining us. Thank you to Dean Cahill. Uh, I think it's apropos that he is, uh, the Joseph Crea Dean, given how much Lisa referenced, uh, Professor Crea during our, um, discussion. And I'll end by saying that real estate is truly uh, a passion of mine uh, from the moment that I was lucky enough to get a seat in Debbie's amazing clinic 
and started looking at my first title report, um, I knew that there was something there. I didn't know that title would be in my future, but I knew that there was something there that's transactional real estate law is really what I wanted to do. And uh, I'm thrilled to be part of this network, and I'm thrilled that I, I was asked to, to be the moderator, and I can't thank all of you enough. Uh, and thank you all for attending, and please stay safe, and we'll do this again very soon. And next time we'll hear from Debbie, I promise you.